Hello, everybody. Please, uh, I, I'd invite you to uh, get coffee, uh, refreshments. It's going to be available throughout uh, the morning. Uh, but we do want to get started. This is, uh, uh, this is, I think, our sixth or seventh, sixth, sixth conference that we have done jointly with Jetro. I always look forward to it. I think it, it's one of those things where you correct one of our shortcomings in Washington. You know, we're a, a big and complex and sophisticated country, but when it comes to Washington, we're a one-trick pony. You know, we only can do one thing at a time. And uh, right now, the only thing on people's mind is Libya, you know, and we can't decide if we're going to do a, a no-fly zone over Libya. We're going to spend days on this, you know, I mean, and uh, that's Washington. Uh, we, we tend to, whatever is burning white hot in the inbox that morning, that becomes our entire focus. And, uh, and of course, and I was talking to uh, one, of our, one of our panelists, Lynn Hudson, uh, she said, you know, there's a difference between you know, r responsiveness and having a strategy. You know, reaction is not a strategy. And we tend to spend too much of the public dynamic of Washington simply in reaction. You know, and what we really need to do is to invert our thinking and make it spend more of our time on strategy. Uh, let me just uh, use a little analogy. I, when, I, when I first went to DOD, a friend of mine said, let's imagine that you've got, you've got four inboxes on your desk. One is for urgent and important. One inbox is for non-urgent but important. One is for non-urgent, or is for important but not urgent. One is for non-important, non-urgent. Which of those four boxes would you go to first in the morning when you walk in the door? I said, well, of course, you would go to the urgent important. And he said, no. He said, when you do that, you have lost all the time to react and to plan. You should go to the important but not urgent every morning. You, know, you ought to be looking at things where you have a chance to think about it and respond to it and shape it. Because if you only spend your time every morning going to the urgent important box, you don't have any flexibility. You know, that's kind of where we are in Washington <laughs> perpetually, you know. Uh, and what this conference is about is the important but not urgent. Okay, this gives us the chance for us to think out into the future about strategic developments and say, how does this, what does this mean for us? How important is this? Where is this going? And I, I really congratulate Jetro for having the foresight and the vision to make this part of their mission on behalf of Japan and reaching out and helping us along the way. This is a very important partnership for us to be thinking through what is the strategic dimension that we want to start to cultivate that's important for all of us in the greater Pacific Eurasian region. Uh, we had an interesting conversation last night about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, this is part, it's unresolved business. It's important business. It's not clear where it's going. Where should this take us? These are the kinds of important, non-urgent conversations that we need to have in Washington. And so I look forward to this day very much, and it's going to be an interesting day. Uh, I especially want to welcome to Washington again uh, Yasuo Hayashi. He's a, a great friend. We've had a chance to work with him now for a number of years. He, of course, came to Jetro after a remarkable career. Uh, he both is a, a student at uh, University of Tokyo and at Oxford. Uh, and then had a very distinguished career in METI, uh, has been in the private sector, and then they just drug him back in. He's got to help. Probably not the easiest time to have been brought into government, Hayashi-san. I mean, uh, you know, when the new government came to power in Tokyo and wanted to go after the bureaucrats, I think Jetro was one of the high ones on their target list, and yet I think it took them a while to prove out the value of Jetro uh, to Japan. And, and today it's going to be a value to all of us. And so we welcome you to Washington. Hayashi-san, thank you for your leadership. Let me invite you to the stage to get this conference started for real. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is really true that they, I came back from the private sector to the governmental organization about four years ago, and I didn't realize uh, the position is so tough, <laughs> uh, particularly the relation between government and our organization is, well, I have never expected this sort of tough job. But anyway, it's a really uh, uh, comfort and the ease of mind to be able to come to Washington every year and to be able to discuss the important issues with you and with CSIS friends and the American friends together. Thank you very much indeed. And also thank you, John, for your kind introduction. And the, uh, my name is Yasuo Hayashi, Japan, the chairman of uh, Japan External Trade Organization, JETRO. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule uh, to attend the JETRO CSIS seminar today. Well, let me extend my gratitude to Dr. John Hamre, head of CI CSIS, and also uh, to Dr. Michael Green, a senior advisor and Japan chair, as well as their colleagues at CSIS for their hard work in organizing this event. Uh, we have been holding this annual seminar, as uh, John mentioned, uh, here in Washington uh, six times in the past. No, this, this is the sixth time since nine, uh, 2004. And this year marks the sixth annual event. Uh, debate is accelerating on East Asian economic integration and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. So the timing of this year's seminar could not be more ideal. Today I would like to talk about four points. Uh, first, progress of Japan's EPA, FTA's efforts. And the second, three achievements in East Asia Asian economic integration. The third, considerations about TPP and direction of East Asian economic integration. And finally, challenges facing the integration process and the, the importance of US involvement. Now, first of all, I would like to report on the progress of Japan's uh, EPAs, FTAs. As you can see in slide one, Japan has EPAs in effect with 10 countries. Slide one, eh? And one region. And recently signed an EPA with India and concluded negotiations with Peru. We are also still in talks with Australia. The Gulf Cooperation Council, GCC, and South Korea and examining the possibility of launching negotiations with other countries and regions, such as ASEAN plus six, ASEAN plus three, a three-way pact with China and South Korea, and also deals with Mongolia and EU, and quite recently with Canada. Uh, this past November, the Khan administration adopted its basic policy on comprehensive economic partnerships with a view to opening up the country and pioneering a new future. The policy pledged to actively promote high-level economic partnerships with major trading powers in no way of inferior to global trends. Each year at this, this event, I report on the progress of economic integration in East Asia, including Japan. Depending on the year, uh, I have had to rack my brains to come up with something worthy of reporting. However, this year, I am pleased to be able to share with you three achievements. Well, this is, well, I'm very happy this year to be able to report something productive. The first is progress in TPP discussions. Following the cabinet decision to adopt the aforementioned basic policy on comprehensive economic partnership, Japan held consultations with the United States in January of this year, as well as 
discussions with our relevant countries. It is expected that Japan will make a decision on whether or not to join TPP discussions by this June. When prospects for the success of the WTO Doha round remain uncertain, and the number of high-level EPAs and FTAs being concluded between major trading part powers is on the increase, Japan views TPP as a vital means to keep the country's trade and investment environment competitive. Some argue that Japan's designation of agricultural products as sensitive items uh, prevents it from making progress in negotiations. I believe that if each negotiations a partner took a pragmatic, pragmatic approach in the, this respect, rather than an all or nothing one, it would surely help advance negotiations. Uh, it is true, as uh, uh, Michael uh, said yesterday, last, uh, yesterday evening at la uh, uh, dinner time, there are many oppositions actually in the, among politicians. Well, he, he mentioned 75 politicians are against, but uh, I think the, the right of negotiations, the right of uh, conclude uh, the treaty uh, is in the hands of the government. The once government concludes uh, the negotiations, it's very difficult for politicians to vote against the treaty. So I am very optimistic uh, to the conclusion. One, uh, if the can government or any government, I, I can't say any government, uh, can government, uh, well, uh, conclude the negotiations, I think it's quite possible that we can get into negotiations and can reach an agreement and, the, well, it may take some time, but I'm hopeful. Japan is still the world's largest importer of agricultural products. And some developed economies in the United States and some EU countries provide financial support to their agricultural sectors to boost international competitiveness. It's well known. In this context, I believe that implementation of appropriate structural reforms with appropriate support will provide a platform for the Japanese agricultural sector to survive international competition in the global market, at least for some agricultural items. At the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos this past January, Prime Minister Khan delivered a special address. Uh, in his presentation, he suggested that it is compatible to promote economic partnership and revitalize agriculture at the same time. As an example, he referred to the positive feedback from attendees of the Japan Night in Davos 2011 uh, which introduced Japanese foods. Well, Jetro sponsored this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, healthy and delicious were the common remarks from guests, uh, which to the Prime Minister demonstrated the competitiveness of Japanese foods. I think uh, uh, even in the United States, Japanese foods are very popular. I recognize this in New York. The second achievement I would like to discuss is increased membership at the East Asia Summit. Amid China's growing presence, especially in the ASEAN region, it was agreed that the United States and Russia uh, would join the East Asia Summit from uh, 2011. The summit members, that is, the ASEAN plus six countries, decided to welcome the new members and to proceed with various initiatives they had undertaken with CEPIA, C-E-P-E-A, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership for East Asia, and ERIA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. This was also uh, established by the initiative of Japan and JETRO and METI. Well, this, is, this organization is the uh, equivalent uh, Asian version of OECD. So this was established within the framework of ASEAN plus six. And for the third achievement, various frameworks initiatives have been launched with a focus on ASEAN. These include the so-called SEPIA of ASEAN plus six, 
and EFTA, EAFTA of ASEAN Plus 3, which aims at integrating and strengthening the FTA hub and spoke network among ASEAN's six FTA partners, including Japan. These initiatives were upgraded two years ago to become intergovernmental projects and are now under consideration. Well, I mentioned this because JETRO always, uh, uh, you know, asked by the government to lay the path for this uh, integration process. And we have been working very hard. And I, we, we were at ease that government took up uh, very recently. In these intergovernmental discussions, they cited infrastructure development as an essential factor for East Asian growth. At the East Asian Summit in October 2010, ERIA, the, OECD, the Asian version of OECD, uh, presented its comprehensive Asia development plan in response to the intergovernmental discussions. Under this plan, some 700 hard infrastructure projects worth $400 billion need to be carried out. Both Japan and the United States should be capable of promoting development throughout the whole of Asia and by, thereby enhance the economy of the entire region. I would like to touch upon TPP and the East Asian Economic Integration here. To facilitate our discussion, I would like to clarify the framework of TPP and the direction of economic integration in Asia. I understand that some in the United States are skeptical about the promotion of economic integration in Asia without the involvement of the United States due to, the, due to concern possibly over China. On the other hand, in Asia, especially in ASEAN and China, some voice their suspicion over the TPP framework, saying it is for the developed countries in the Pacific region, and some say maybe it will, uh, it will be an organization to you know, separate China out of the framework, and may hold back Asia's economic integration by dividing Asia. I believe that both views are misunderstandings. The purpose of frameworks for economic partnership agreements in Asia is to redress intra-regional disparities, abolish trade and investment barriers, and facilitate trade and infrastructure development of the region. They help Asia maintain its position as an, as an engine of growth in the world and ensure that it can make its contribution to the development of the global economy. We have reached a stage where it is inevitable to institutionalize East Asia's framework for economic integration, uh, which has evolved on a de facto basis. At the moment, discussions over FTAs are proceeding on an individual basis between ASEAN plus one countries, uh, which is already complete. ASEAN plus one is now complete. And uh, between China and Taiwan, China and Taiwan, ECFA, and between China and South Korea, and between Japan and South Korea, the overlap of these individual frameworks, cynically referred to as a noodle balls, has reached the levels administratively uncontrollable. This is why a unified regional, regional framework is necessary, and discussions on this are inevitable. SEPIA, ASEAN plus six, and IFTA, ASEAN plus three, are examples of such unifying uh, frameworks. ASEAN and China need not regard TPP as an inhibiting factor for Asia's development. On the contrary, economic integration in Asia will be achieved through TPP. Without such a region-wide scheme, it will be impossible to establish anything that has a real effect. TPP will merely be a first step in the right direction, and as such, it should be regarded as a milestone for a wider economic partnership. 
at the last APEC meeting in Yokohama, it was agreed that concrete steps should be taken to bring reality to the vision to create free trade area of the Asia Pacific, FTAAP. It is declared in the APEC Yokohama vision that an FTAAP would be the goal for APEC and that any existing frameworks should be step, stepping stones to achieve it. Or it may take some time, but the, uh, well, this is the final goal for the A APEC countries to aim for. This is why the region has discussed on many occasions strategies to promote liberalization and facilitation of trade and investment on an APEC-wide basis. Too much skepticism will be of no use. Regional economic integration can be achieved only through mutual trust and by promoting economic cooperation. Here we should look to a classic Japanese saying, of course, the flow of river, or you can say it, uh, integration process, is ceaseless and its water is never the same. But lastly, I would like to talk about the challenges of the integration process and the importance of U.S. involvement. First of all, it is important to convince Japan and the other East Asian countries of the specific positive effects that economic integration will bring, such as economic development, etc. In respect to the comprehensive Asia Development Plan, I mentioned before, it would be difficult to persuade any one country to finance all the costs for infrastructure development projects using public funds or ODA. Instead, such projects need to be tackled jointly and or utilize public-private partnerships, PPPs. Against this background, Japanese and Australian business groups organized a joint mission uh, to India in July of last year. The group, made up of 70 representatives, examined the status of the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor project and other local infrastructure development projects. The aim was to identify possible ways for the two countries to cooperate in India's PPP infrastructure market. I understand that another joint mission will also be sent to Indonesia in May. Likewise, Japan and the United States should consider undertaking such joint efforts in the area of infrastructure development. Well, the uh, <coughs> other East Asian countries need all these efforts as well. The huge economic disparities that exist among the 10 Asi ASEAN nations should also be taken into account to ensure smooth integration. I mentioned Singapore's GDP per capita in, is higher than that of Japan at uh, $43,000 in 2010. And the, well, last year I mentioned 100 times more, but 74 times that of Myanmar's, which is only Myanmar's GDP per capita is $580. This is why, I, as I have mentioned before, we need to focus both on liberalization and development in our approach and take initiative for cooperation. Furthermore, as shown in this graph, some ASEAN countries, in particular Vietnam and Indonesia, have seen their trade deficits soar in recent years. This trend may hinder the efforts towards liberalization and the strategies to ensure development of supporting industries and the increased international competitiveness have become urgent issue in these countries. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Votri Tan, Vice President of the Central Institute for Economic Management, CM. I'm sure that Dr. Tan will guide us on measures being undertaken in Vietnam. For several years now, I have taken every opportunity, including at this forum, to stress the importance of U.S. involvement in East Asian economic integration. I would like to stress it again, particularly when var various frameworks are being discussed and put in place. However, as a positive step, as one I took 
great pleasure in hearing about, the United States was invited to attend the East Asia Summit this year, as I mentioned. Uh, to conclude, I will just uh, say that East Asia needs a region-wide framework that takes into account its incredible diversity in terms of political structures, societies, and also economic and financial aspects. A hastily pursued framework that does not take these things into consideration may actually weaken or slow the economic integration process itself. Also, as I pointed out, there are many areas, both at the government and the business levels, where the United States and Japan can and should cooperate. This concludes my opening address. Thank you very much for your kind attention.